Services about you. You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke, and just as a reminder, the views and opinions expressed on Words on Film are solely those of your host and movie critic Dan Burke. They do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees working at the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. With that said, I've got five new movies to review for you for this show. But first, I'm going to get into my normal segment, normal first segment, that is, which is what's topping the box office. These are the top ten highest grossing films of this past weekend. And a couple of surprises, actually, including the movie I didn't expect to take the number one spot. I actually thought Solo, a Star Wars story, would... Hold on to that number one spot, but surprisingly it hasn't. The number one movie at the box office this week is Ocean's 8, which debuted with $41.6 million gross at the box office. Internationally, it's grossed $54.1 million, and that's against a budget of $70 million. So Ocean's 8 is neither a, a hit here in the States or around the world, but it is well on its way to becoming at least a tentative hit by next week. Solo, a Star Wars story for the first time in its three-week run is not number one at the box office and is actually kind of struggling in terms of how much money it's making, which is, which is too bad because I thought it was a decent film. Solo, a Star Wars story is so far grossed in the United States, rather, excuse me, this weekend it grossed $15.7 million. Against a budget of $250 million, it has so far grossed $176.7 million at the U.S. box office and $313.4 million worldwide, making it not a hit yet here in the U.S., but around the world it is already a tentative hit. And it's pretty disappointing, especially considering that the movie's been out for three weeks and it has Star Wars attached to it, not to mention that it's directly related to the Star Wars canon. However, it is probably showing a little bit of Star Wars fatigue amongst the movie-going public. But that is just, of course, speculation on my part. Deadpool 2, despite only being number one at the box office for one week, is number three this week. But despite that, it's actually making it's actually made more money at the U.S. box office than Solo, a Star Wars story, and cost a lot less to make. This weekend, it grossed $14.1 million in the U.S. box office. Against a budget of $110 million, Deadpool 2 has so far grossed $279.2 million here in the States and $655.7 million worldwide, making it a certified hit here in the States and around the world. Hereditary is actually doing pretty well, despite the fact that it debuted at number four. It is the number two highest grossing debut movie, but it has less to lose than Ocean's 8, given Hereditary's budget. Against a budget of $10 million, Hereditary is so far grossed in just one weekend, $13.6 million here in the States, and $18.7 million worldwide, which makes it automatically a tentative hit here in the States and around the world, but it will probably be a certified hit by next week. Avengers Infinity War, I'm just going to tell you, it is, well, actually, it, it might surprise you how, how well it's doing here in the States. But it grossed $7.2 million this past weekend, its seventh week in release, against a budget of $316 to $400 million, somewhere in that range. Avengers Infinity War so far grossed $655.1 million here in the States and $2 billion worldwide. Now, around the world, it is already a certified hit. Here in the States, it may or may not be, depending on what its budget actually is. If its budget is as low as $316 million, then it is a certified hit. But if it's as much as $400 million, it's a tentative hit. But again, I'm just going to go with it being a tentative hit here in the States. But either way, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Adrift, in its second week of release, fell from number three last week to number six this week at the box office, having grossed $5.3 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $35 million, Adrift has so far grossed $22 million here in the States and $22.8 million worldwide, meaning that despite its modest budget or comparatively modest budget compared to the comic book superhero movies, it is not a hit yet here in the States or around the world. And the fact that it dropped out of the top five in just one week is not a very good sign for this movie. 
Number seven at the box office is Book Club, which is doing extremely well given its budget. It's number seven this week, having dropped slightly from number five last week, and it grossed $4.3 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $10 million, just $10 million, Book Club has so far grossed $57 million here at the U.S. box office and $62.6 million worldwide, making it a certified hit here in the States and around the world by quite a bit. Book, uh, excuse me, Hotel Artemis is number eight at the box office, and it's the number three highest grossing debut movie of the week, having grossed just $3.2 million at the U.S. box office this weekend against a budget of $15 million. I don't have the international numbers for you for Hotel Artemis, but I can tell you that it is not a hit here in the United States by a long shot. And I don't know how well it's doing around the world, but so far it's not looking particularly good for Hotel Artemis. Upgrade is a movie that I actually championed last week. Last week it debuted at number six at the box office, which wasn't stellar, but I thought it would actually do better or get a pretty good word of mouth, but it actually isn't. It dropped to number nine this week, having grossed $2.4 $2.4 million at the U.S. box office. Against a budget ranging from 3 to $5 million, Upgrade has so far grossed $9.3 million in the United States and an undisclosed amount worldwide. So, again, whether it's a tentative hit or a certified hit depends on how much it actually costs to make. If it was as low as $3 million or even $4 million to make, Upgrade might be a certified hit by now in the States. If it costs as much as $5 million, I can only say that it is a tentative hit. However, Upgrade is still doing pretty well for itself, especially given its minuscule budget. But given its status on the top 10, or its rank in the top 10 in just two weeks, it's unlikely we're going to see this movie in the top 10 next week. And a movie we are probably most definitely not going to see in the top 10 next week is Melissa McCarthy in Life of the Party, which is number 10 at the box office, sliding from number 7 last week. It's been out for five weeks, and it's grossed $2.2 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. But against a budget of $30 million, Life of the Party has so far grossed $50.3 million here in the States and $59.6 million worldwide making it a tentative hit here in the States and around the world. Around the world is very close to being a certified hit, but we won't see it be a certified hit in the top 10 by next week. That I can assure you. Don't ignore facial redness. It could be an early warning sign of rosacea, a life-disruptive facial disorder that gets worse without treatment. Over time, the redness becomes more persistent and tiny blood vessels may appear. Without medical help, bumps, pimples, and even facial disfigurement often develop. 16 million Americans have rosacea, yet only a small fraction are being treated. Don't ignore the warning signs. See a dermatologist or visit the National Rosacea Society at rosacea.org. Never stop the madness. Tuesdays at 9 p.m. BostonFreeRadio.com Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And just as a reminder, you are listening to Words on Film this week on BostonFreeRadio.com and WBCA-FM. You are... or you're watching me on SCAT-V, that is Summerville Community Access Television, or some community TV station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast. To them, I say thank you as always. Or you are watching me and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my topic, my favorite topic, that is, which is movies. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Ocean's 8, which just debuted at number one. And this is, of course, uh, sort of not so much a sequel, but a spinoff to the remakes of the Ocean's 11 film. Um, actually, Ocean, Ocean's 11 was at first one film starring the Rat Pack, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., and others. And then it was remade back in 2002 with George Clooney, Brad Pitt, Matt Damon, and several other actors, as you might know. And it had two 
pretty successful sequels afterwards. So Ocean's 8 is more of a spinoff to that Ocean's 11 series more than a sequel. And in the th- this movie, Ocean's 8, you're introduced to Debbie Ocean, who's played by Sandra Bullock. And it turns out she is the younger sister of Danny Ocean, the character played by George Clooney, who is now, according to this movie, dead. And Debbie Ocean has just spent five years, eight months, and 12 days, and this is specified in the movie, in prison for planning a heist. Eventually, she is released, and she is eventually reconnected with her partner in crime and friend Lou, who's played by Kate Blanchett. And it says in some sources that Lou, again, Kate Blanchett character, Kate Blanchett's character is Debbie's girlfriend. And I'm not sure if that's meant to be platonic or not, but either way, they form some sort of kinship. And of course, they are connected by one particular thing, our particular thing in common, which is they have a penchant for committing heists. And this time they are they are on the search for a certain piece of jewelry that is rarely taken out in public, but it is taken out on a certain week weekend or for a gala, which a celebrity by the name of Daphne Kluger is going to be attending. And after intense security, she's going to be wearing this very expensive necklace. And Daphne Kluger, by the way, is played by Anne Hathaway in a role that's not too much of a stretch from how Anne Hathaway is in real life. In other words, she is an A-list actress who commands attention on the red carpet. And certainly, and, and certainly, excuse me, just a little distracted there, she plays this role as if it comes naturally to her, which it definitely does. So eventually you learn that Anne Hathaway's character, despite her public persona is actually in on this heist because this ornate and ostentatious necklace she's wearing is not just any necklace. It is also worth $150 million. So eventually Debbie Ocean and her girlfriend Lou assemble a team of six other women, including Anne Hathaway's character, to not only steal this necklace, but also make an exact replica of it and elude any security that, uh, of course, would be guarding this necklace, of which there are several. So you're introduced to the other five members of Ocean's 8, including Amita, who is a jewelry maker and can spot a real piece of jewelry from a fake one, and she's played by Mindy Kaling, And you're also introduced to a suburban mom and profiteer by the name of Tammy, who's played by Sarah Paulson, who is responsible for basically finding the machinery, the the 3D printer to create a replica of this, this necklace, which is actually made of cubit zirconia, not a real diamond. And there's also a petty thief by the name of Constance, who's played by a relative newcomer by the name of Aquafina. Uh, and her name, by the way, is spelled, her real life name, or rather her stage name is spelled A-W-K-W-A-F-I-N-A. It's not spelled like the brand of bottled water. But either way, Aquafina is actually a woman I've seen in a couple of other movies, including Neighbors 2, but I haven't recognized her until now. So she's probably the closest thing to a newcomer that this movie has. And there's also the other two members of Ocean's 8 include Rose uh, Rose Wheel, who is a fashion designer who's played in Delightful Eccentricity by Helen Bonham Carter. And finally, last but not least, there's also Nineball, who's a technical genius, whose real name is Leslie. And she's a Rastafarian woman, presumably from Jamaica, who is not only a genius at hacking and computers, but she also is very enthusiastic about the ganja. And Nine Ball is played in this movie by Rihanna in probably what I think is her best role to date. I thought all the women worked really well and I think played off very well alongside one another. 
And even though they, they have contrasting personalities and seemingly nothing in common, with the exception of Kate Blanchett's and, and Sandra Bullock's character, I really was taken in by the, their dynamic and also the just the, the fact that they pulled off this heist as cleverly as they did. I wasn't especially crazy about what happened after the heist. In other words, the investigation that's also being conducted in this movie by a guy by the name of John Frazier, who's an insurance fraud investigator, who's played by late night talk show host James Corden. I thought he made an interesting character, but it seemed like as soon as he was introduced, his character was dropped almost as quickly as he was made present. But... Other than the fact that the the story was a little predictable, I did actually like it. And I I loved all the women in the movie. And one of the things I was afraid of going into this movie, and what I'm still afraid of, is this movie would be probably undermined by several people who are are probably uh, have sexism in mind when they when they say when they go into this movie with a preconceived notion that it will suck just because it has women in it, which I think unfairly undermined how good the Ghostbusters reboot was. But Ocean's 8 I give a low knockout to because I think the women in the movie acted very well alongside one another. This is an important message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Wildfire smoke can cause health problems for anyone, especially those with heart and lung conditions, older adults, and children. Listen for advice from local authorities. Avoid burning candles using gas stoves or vacuuming. Do not use dust masks as they will retain harmful particles. If you have asthma or other lung conditions, follow your respiratory management plan. See a doctor if you have a hard time breathing. Hey, 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 it's Genevieve, a.k.a. Miss Fab 617. And it's your girl, Crystal, a.k.a. The Crystal Lens. We're coming to you from our new show called Boston Boston Come Come Through. Through. We'll be bringing you the latest and greatest things happening in and around Boston. We'll be talking what? Black-owned businesses, social events, what? And the black experience. How's that sound, Genevieve? I love it. Dig it. Tune in every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio. Boston, come through. Come listen. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Hereditary. And this is a movie from a person who is making his directorial debut, or at least feature film directorial debut. His name is Ari Aster. And I got to tell you, I would not have guessed that this guy is making his his full-length feature debut from watching this movie because this film has the shall we say, this movie looks like it was made by a seasoned professional. Granted that Ari Aster, Ari Aster has made several short films, and I haven't seen any of those films, but I can tell you that Hereditary is probably one of the best movies I've seen in a while. It is unquestionably the scariest movie of the year so far. Scariest movie of the decade? Probably. Scariest movie of the century, that is the years 2000 to the present, possibly. But I went into this film thinking this is just going to be another run-of-the-mill horror film. And it certainly takes inspiration from several movies, uh, which are (laughs) probably no-brainers from which to take inspiration, like Rosemary's Baby and The Exorcist. But the fact that I am comparing Hereditary to those films positively says a lot about how good this movie is. So... There are a lot of surprises in this film, and one of my big rules when hosting this movie, excuse me, this movie show, is that I don't give away spoilers. Or if I do, if I give away a potential spoiler, I give you a heads up. I give you a spoiler alert, like most people do. So the main plot of the story is this. When the matriarch of the Graham family passes away, her daughter's family begins to unravel cryptic and increasingly terrifying secrets about their ancestry. That is the plot in a nutshell. To tell you any more about the plot elements of the story will ruin the movie for you. So, again, if you are somebody who is not a fan of horror films, you might want to sit this one out. I mean, even I, who, who likes horror films, it's not my favorite genre, but I certainly don't miss them when they're out in theaters or I don't try to avoid them if they are. 
I, I was taken aback by how chilling and how terrifying this film was. It is certainly very intense, and it also has great intense performances by Tony Collette, who plays the said matriarch of this family who just experienced a death in the family and is dealing with grief in her own way. And she certainly runs the gamut of emotions that you would expect from someone who experienced a death in the family, having lost someone close to her. And there's also a great performance in this movie by Alex Wolf, who plays Tony Collette's son, Peter. And Alex Wolf is somebody you probably would recognize from the movie Patriots Day, where he played Jahar Zarnayev. And he was undoubtedly one of the best actors in Patriots Day. Patriots Day was, for several reasons, a disappointingly mediocre film. But Alex Wolf, as Jahar Zarnayev, did a great job in that film. He was also in a really good film last year called My Friend Dahmer, where he played the guy. Uh, John Backdurf, who also wrote and illustrated the graphic novel upon which the movie My Friend Dahmer is based. He did a great job in that film, too. But this is his best role to date. And even though the Oscars are several months away and we're not even halfway through the year, I would love to see Alex Wolf and Tony Collette get some kind of attention at the Oscars. And my guess is they probably will. So... You have Tony Collette, who plays Annie, who's the matriarch of the family. You have her teenage son, Peter, who's played by Alex Wolf. The patriarch of the family is Steve, who's played by Gabriel Byrne. And even though Gabriel Byrne is a very good actor, I did feel kind of bad for him in this movie because here you have two actors, Tony Collette and Alex Wolf, who are grieving in their own ways in this film and certainly take up a lot of the emotional energy of the film. And here he is feeling a little bit thankless or seeming a little bit thankless as the more level-headed of the members of the family and certainly the, the guy who is trying in vain to hold everything together. And also what I found interesting is that Gabriel Byrne in this film kept his Irish accent. And it, it did surprise me because I would... If, if if somebody who is not American is in an American movie and he, he or she doesn't keep their accent, I'm always wondering if that's a good idea. Because if they if they keep their British or Irish or any other <laughs> nationalities accent, I'm I'm always wondering is the movie going to explain how they got to this country and why they're married to an American? Because Tony Collette is is actually Australian, and she lost her Australian accent for this film. And I, I think that if she had kept her Australian accent, that also would have been distracting. But either way, I'm not going to fault Gabriel Byrne for, for not keeping his Irish accent. Either way, he did have somewhat of a thankless role being the more level-headed here, but if Gabriel Byrne wasn't the level-headed one, somebody else would would have to be. <laughs> Otherwise, these people would tear themselves apart. And there's also a noteworthy performance here by the daughter in the family, whose name in the movie is Charlie, who's played by Millie Shapiro. And Millie Shapiro has had a lot of experience on Broadway. She's actually acted in a couple of productions of Annie on Broadway. But here, she's making her feature film debut. And she plays the weird kid you would expect to see in a horror film with a with a child in it who has some connection with the dead. But after that, the cliches pretty much stop there. This movie gets really twisted and really disturbing, but the reason it's great is not because of how dark and disturbing it is. What makes it really disturbing is the fact that it deals with several valid emotions that people go through when losing a family member. It deals with grief, anxiety, fear, and also your mind playing tricks on you. I, I was mesmerized by this, this film as I was watching it, and by the time it ended, the way it ended, I just sat there in the theater watching the credits, not because I wanted to see if there was a deleted scene at the end. I just sat there thinking, okay, I'm going to need a minute. I, I did see this by myself in a theater with two other people in it, but... I wanted, I wanted to talk to somebody about it, but at the same time, I just needed to breathe. 
And Hereditary is certainly a very scary movie. It gets my rating of a very enthusiastic knockout. It is amazing, just not only the special effects, but the performances in this film, and I hope it gets the Oscar attention it deserves. Hope you enjoyed your meal. And I just want to say, he's lucky to have a brother like you. Lucky? Caring for my brother is far from easy. But he's a part of me, like my arms and legs, so I'll be his. No time for tired. Nothing can disable this love. He needs me, but I'm the lucky one, even though I need help now and then. If you're caring for a loved one, visit aarp.org caregiving for care guides and community. Support for your strength. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Diane Wong here announcing a new radio program. Let's talk about race. From our beginnings as a white supremacist society to our current existence, as a white supremacist society. Race is a topic that affects us all, and yet we have difficulty talking about it. Why is race so difficult? Why can't we talk openly about white supremacy? Why don't we like to talk about white privilege? Why is internalized oppression shrouded in mystery? What about lynching? What about gerrymandering and the current Black Lives Matters debate? We'll talk about all of it. Come and join us Thursdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Let's talk about race. Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Hotel Artemis, which is the feature-length debut, uh, directorial debut of Drew Pierce. And... Drew Pierce has been around the movie business for over a decade, but his directorial efforts previous to Hotel, excuse me, Hotel Artemis have included a number of video shorts, including one called um, One Shot, All Hail the King, which is actually based on um, characters from Iron Man 3, including... Trevor Slatterly, who's played by Ben Kingsley in both Iron Man 3 and, of course, this this video short. So, yeah, Drew Pierce has had some... He's been kind of a silent competitor in, in terms of the... the, the, the in, in terms of Hollywood. But Hotel Artemis is a pretty impressive directorial debut, which, despite having a first-time director directing a feature-length film boasts a very impressive cast, including Jodie Foster, Sterling K. Brown, Zachary Quinto, and Jeff Goldblum, amongst other people. So Hotel Artemis is a movie that's set in riot-torn, near-future Los Angeles. It's actually set during 2028. What Los Angeles residents are rioting about, the movie doesn't really elaborate upon, but it doesn't really need to either. But Hotel Artemis follows the nurse, who's played by Jodie Foster, and that is actually her name. She's not given any other name. She's only known as the nurse. And she runs a secret members-only emergency room for criminals. It turns out that the nurse might actually be a doctor, but she's certainly somebody who is experienced in the medical profession and was and lost her medical license years ago for reasons the movie slightly elaborates upon, but g- gives enough of an elaboration to still create a mystery for Jodie Foster's character. And she takes in a number of criminals who are members of this Hotel Artemis Hospital, including Waikiki, who's played by Sterling K. Brown, who comes to this underground hospital to treat his brother, Honolulu, who's played by Brian Tyree Henry. Also in this hotel are a, an, an assassin by the name of Nice, who's played by Sophia Butella, and also a a arms deal an, an arms dealer who is a bit of a loudmouth who's whose name is Acapulco who's played by a, a a character actor you know is a loudmouth Charlie Day and eventually the you 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 learn that the hotel artemis has various rules among them no guns 
no cops, and probably the most important rule of all, no killing the other patients. Well, eventually those rules are put to the test, especially when the nurse finds an acquaintance of hers who happens to be a cop. Her name is Morgan, and she's played by Jenny Slate. So Jodie Foster's character has a choice to either let that cop die because she's a cop or take her in because she knows her from years ago when Jodie Foster's character had a medical license. So there are a number of colorful characters in this film, and I credit this movie for its originality. I, I would have liked to have known a little bit about what Hotel Artemis was like perhaps before it became an underground hospital for criminals and how it went from a rundown flea bag hotel in the rundown part of LA to being what it is in this movie. I would have liked to have gotten a little bit of history from that, but again, I, I did like all the characters and I, I appreciated the fact that this movie left a little bit of a mystery to how they got into their life of crime and also, well, <laughs> how this, hospital may or may not have come to be but i i really liked all the characters and i liked how all the actors portrayed their individual characters jodie foster of course was the standout actress and of course when she's in the underground hospital she talks a big game she certainly sticks intuitively to her rules but she also as you find out has a fear of actually going outside and when you see jodie foster go from being uh, sort of a, a tough-as-nails nurse slash doctor who doesn't take any crap from anyone, especially people who don't have a membership, to showing a, a lot of vulnerability in her anxiety of the outdoors. I, I thought that revealed a lot about her character, and Jodie Foster did a good job with that. Sterling K. Brown is making a name for himself these days with his role on the hit TV series This Is Us. But he's been in a couple of other uh, movies and TV shows. In, in this movie, he plays it pretty straight, but he still does a pretty good job. And I thought that the dynamic between him and his on-screen brother, Brian Tyree Henry, was genuine. And, of course, when, when Jeff Goldblum comes in as the, the crime boss, Niagara, and, of course, you don't know his real name. All, all you know is just that, <laughs> that moniker that, that he goes by. I, I actually thought Jeff Goldblum did a pretty good job in this movie too. Again, I'm one of the very few people who didn't who thought Jeff Goldblum was miscast in the recent Thor movie, uh, Thor Ragnarok. But of course, when Jeff Goldblum's good, he, he's really good, and I think he played a, a, a lot better and even more intimidating of a character in this movie than I've seen him play in a really long time. Of course, we all know what Jeff Goldblum's on-screen personality is genuinely like, whether he's in The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai or Jurassic Park or Independence Day. He's been known for playing kind of the same sort of awkward, stuttering characters. And finally, in this movie, he doesn't play that. And I appreciated that Jeff Goldblum is still genuine in this film, but also brave enough to play against type. So... I also loved Sophia Butella in this movie. She was so sexy, and she also exuded a certain amount of confidence in this film that I, I thought she also stood out in this film. Um, and, of course, she was the only thing I liked about The Mummy from last year. So there's a lot to like about Hotel Artemis. I give it my rating of a knockout because despite the fact that you can see a lot of Quentin Tarantino influence to the point that some people might write this off as a Quentin Tarantino ripoff, I say give this movie a chance. I think especially the characters in this movie are very original, and I can see this being a cult classic in the future. In the wake of a disaster, what one thing can you send that will help people the most? A blanket, a tent, a sandbag, a doctor. Actually, if you send a monetary donation, you send all these things. Even a small donation can make a big impact and can quickly become exactly what people affected by disaster need most. In the wake of a hurricane, your monetary donation can make a huge difference to those in need. To donate, visit supporthurricanerelief.org. That's supporthurricanerelief.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. You want free speech? I got your free speech right here. It's all about free speech, baby. BostonFreeRadio.com Time! 
This is Alan Patterson. I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations, including prog, psychedelia, garage and punk, Motown, old school R&B, soul, blues, jazz, gospel, folk, old school country, zydeco, all music New Orleans, rockabilly, bluegrass, world music, comedy, poetry, and spoken word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is First Reformed. And this is a movie that did not make the top 10 this week. So there is a high probability that you haven't seen this film. But that's kind of my job as a film critic to not only tell you what I think about the movies you have seen or may have seen or at least heard of, but also about the movies you might not have seen. And First Reformed is a movie starring Ethan Hawke, Amanda Seyfried, and also a surprisingly dramatic performance by Cedric Kyles, who you probably know better as Cedric the Entertainer. But this is Cedric Kyles, a.k.a. Cedric the Entertainer, in his first dramatic role. And it was actually wise of him to, to use his real name, Cedric Kyles, because in this movie he's not exactly entertaining, especially since it's a dramatic movie. And the film is written and directed by Paul Schrader. And Paul Schrader has had a rich history of writing and directing films. Of course, he became uh, well-known in Hollywood circles after having written Taxi Driver and eventually adapting such books for Martin Scorsese as Raging Bull, The Last Temptation of Christ, and the underrated Bringing Out the Dead, which came out back in 1999. It's, oh God, it's hard to believe it's been almost 20 years since that movie was released. But either way, Paul Schrader, in addition to writing movies for Martin Scorsese, has also directed uh, his share of... Uh, noteworthy films, including Blue Collar, which was a rare drama starring Richard Pryor, Hardcore, which is an another underrated one starring George C. Scott, which I think if it hadn't been for Hardcore, there'd be no Taken. He also directed the overrated American Gigolo, which I thought was hard, you know, basically softcore porn. But there are some other films that he's directed, which I have liked, such as Autofocus, which, again, it's not a pleasant film to watch, but it the the people in it acted r really well, and Paul Schrader did a good job directing that film. And the truth of the matter is, even though I haven't heard of any films that Paul Schrader has directed since 2013's The Canyons, I have seen, or rather, he has been in, or he has been writing and directing several movies of recent years. Most of them, though, have come have gone directly to streaming, including. The Dying of the Light from 2014 and Dog Eat Dog from 2016, both of which starred Nicolas Cage. But First Reform might actually be the start of a comeback for Paul Schrader. So what is First Reformed about? It is about a priest a um, who I think is a Presbyterian priest, a part of a small congregation in upstate New York who grasped grapples with mounting despair brought on by tragedy, worldly concerns, and a tormented past. So the more you get to know about Ethan Hawke's character, whose character's name in this movie is Toller, he is a Presbyterian priest, which means that unlike Catholic priests, he can get married and have children should he choose. But it turns out as you get to know Ethan Hawke's character, you find out that he was married before, he is now divorced, and he had a child who actually died in the Iraq War. And he shares his grief with a one of his few churchgoers, whose name is Michael, who's played by Philip Ettinger. And Michael is somebody who is very concerned about the threat of global warming. And in addition to his working at Home Depot, 
definitely champions for environmental causes during his free time, especially with the help of his wife, Mary, who's played in this movie by Amanda Seyfried. And eventually, Mary comes to the Father Toller or Pastor Toller to hopefully to get some to to get Michael to r- release some some tension from what he's feeling about the way that the earth is is destroying itself and how to raise a child when such catastrophic events are going on. So this is a movie that's not afraid to raise some troubling questions about what it means to be Christian these days and also what it means to have faith in a world that seemingly doesn't care, that prioritizes polluting and that that prioritizes profiting over caring for the earth. And there certainly are some stunning visuals. And th- there is one character in this movie who kills himself. And I, I kind of gave away, well, the sex of the character who does. But it, it's a turning point in Toller's both life and career because eventually his thought process begins to be not manipulated, but shaped for better or for worse from the events that that go on in his community and the people who seek him out for counseling. And he also has a friendly relationship with a pastor from a nearby church, which is a lot more ostentatious and modernized than the church in which Toller preaches, which is not only scarcely attended, but also a historical building, which in this movie is in the process of celebrating its 250th anniversary. And there's a lot of history behind the church in which Toller preaches. As a matter of fact, there's one point where he brings a class on a field trip and shows them where there was an underground room for runaway slaves to hide during the Civil War or in the events leading up to the Civil War. So I, I liked this film a lot, not only because of the characters and the acting by the likes of Ethan Hawke, Amanda Seyfried, and Cedric Kyles, but I also like the fact that I didn't quite know where the story was going. And I like it when movies are not predictable in that, in that regard. And I also really liked how this movie takes on very challenging notions of Christianity, which is ironic considering that Paul Schrader, who I've actually seen live doing, doing conferences and interviews, is actually an atheist. And I'm not sure, or he, he was at least an atheist the last time I saw him speak, which was back in 2009. But a lot of his films, especially those he's directed like Hardcore and Autofocus, have religious elements behind them. And certainly First Reformed is one of those films. But I liked how it took on the challenging aspects of being Christian in this day and age. And it gets my rating of a knockout. And I really hope that this film doesn't disappear. And it represents a turning point and maybe even a comeback for Paul Schrader. Hi, I'm Danica Patrick. Watching my nieces grow, play, and learn is amazing. But not every child gets to be carefree. One in six kids in the U.S. are hungry. This breaks my heart, and it's something that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste and gives it to families in need. To help, visit feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. I love those real six sides. that move me A thinly blown Neurotic tone Intensify and groove me All this and more on Unpacked Music Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio
Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is the documentary Won't You Be My Neighbor, which was directed by Morgan Neville, who might not be particularly familiar to you, but he actually has won an Academy Award for Best Documentary for the movie 20 Feet from Stardom, which he also produced. In terms of other movies you might know him from, there was one he actually made years ago it was back in 2015 it was called best of enemies buckley versus vidal which is of course uh william buckley the noted conservative versus gore vidal the noted liberal who have actually in a in in a news segment unknowingly changed the face of news from when they were basically debating on the local news back in 1968 that Apparently that hadn't been done before. So Morgan Neville has made several intriguing documentaries. And Won't You Be My Neighbor, which is about the life lessons and legacies of iconic children's television host Fred Rogers, i.e. Mr. Rogers, is certainly no exception. This film takes an unusual approach to uh, the, the life of Fred Rogers, particularly his career, introducing his career first and then not particularly what you would expect most documentaries about people go first introduce the subject at hand then go back to his childhood and tell you exactly how he became who he became and this documentary doesn't do that and by no means is that a fault on the documentary if anything i liked the fact that it kind of broke from the norm and introduced you to the tv show mr rogers neighborhood in its inception and went from there. But there was a lot of interesting things that I learned from uh, from the documentary Won't You Be My Neighbor about Fred Rogers. Some of them I knew, like, for instance, Fred Rogers, despite the urban legend, was not a sniper during the Vietnam War, and he didn't wear those long sleeve shirts to cover up the tattoos he had on his arm. That's one of the nauseating misconceptions about Fred Rogers. But it just goes to show you that... A lot of people, when they see a children's television host or somebody who makes music for children, they think that somebody that squeaky clean has to be hiding some dark side. And even though Fred Rogers was not a perfect individual or he wasn't a a, a saint, pretty much what you saw on the TV show is more or less what you got with some exceptions. There were some surprising things I learned about Fred Rogers from watching this film, and particularly, I I grew up in the 80s and maybe a little bit of the 90s watching Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, and I'm sure that there are generations of kids both before me and after me who did as well. I think the kids who are going to college right now who are entering their freshman year in a couple of months are probably the first generation who did not grow up with Fred Rogers, but the rest of us know exactly how, how I, I wouldn't say revolutionary, but, but how intriguing and ultimately how special the show Mr. Rogers Neighborhood was and what kept us going back to it. And th- there's a, there are a lot of great moments in this film and some intriguing interviews by some people who were, were interviewed specifically for this documentary. For instance, Mr. Rogers' widow is interviewed, two of his sons. I'm not sure if he had more children, but at least... Two of his children were interviewed for this documentary. Also, Yo-Yo Ma, who made several appearances on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And also, probably what I thought was one of the most poignant interviews, a black man by the name of Francois Scarborough Clemens, who played Officer Clemens on the show. And apparently there was an episode of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, which, which, was, which aired on public TV stations nationwide where Mr. Rogers is soaking his feet in a kiddie pool and then Officer Clemens comes along and Mr. Rogers invites Officer Clemens to soak his feet in the pool. And that was significant because at the time there there were still segregation laws that prohibited 
black people and white people from swimming together in the same public pool. And apparently it, it's it's easy to to take it for granted now. But back then, that was a huge deal just to have a black man and a white man just sharing a, a pool together, even if it was just soaking their feet. But there was also some other moments in this film. In fact, I teared up when I I saw Francois Clemens be interviewed and there was a moment where Fred Rogers told him and it's making me kind of choke up as I'm thinking about it that you are special and there's no one else like you. And I, when Francois Clemens teared up when he recounted Fred Rogers saying that to him, I felt myself tearing up too. And there were some missed opportunities for some interviews here. Like, for instance, there were several um, key pieces of footage in this movie from uh, from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, which which featured heavily the actress Betty Aberlin, who played Lady Aberlin in the Neighborhood of Make Believe, where she's having some poignant conversations with one of Mr. Rogers' most famous puppets, Daniel Tiger, who actually has his own cartoon show now based entirely on the neighborhood of make-believe. I was very surprised to see Betty Aberlin not get interviewed for this film, despite the fact that she's still alive today. The, the actor who played Mr. McFeely is in this, and a couple of other um, people who were regulars on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood are as well. I was also surprised not to see Michael Keaton, who started off his acting career in Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, not as an actor, but actually as a cameraman. And also Keith David, who's had an illustrious career both as an on-screen actor and voiceover actor. He also got his start on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. But despite the fact that the, the documentary could have benefited from those other moments of trivial, uh, rather trivia in, in terms of who got their starter, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, and what they became. I still think that this movie got right to the heart of what made Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood so revolutionary and so special, for lack of a better term. And Won't You Be My Neighbor gets my rating of a knockout. I think in terms of documentaries and documentaries that also are biographies, this movie got right to the heart of of. of Mr. Uh, Fred Rogers' significance and how he influenced public television from from that point forward. When I was little, I didn't talk for a long time. I was sensitive to lights and sounds, so I built secret hiding places where they couldn't get in. Sometimes I do the same things over and over until one day I found out I had autism. My family got me help. Slowly, I learned how to live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at AutismSpeaks.org slash signs. Brought to you by Autism Speaks and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tune that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Topper's Radio, that's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Topper's. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And now that I've reviewed all five movies that I'm going to review for you for this show, it's now time for my next segment, which is What's Coming Up Next. These, This is a spoken word preview of the movies that are coming out in theaters this coming weekend and the biggest movie that's coming out in theaters this coming weekend is Incredibles 2 it's not the Incredibles 2 but of course it is the sequel to the Incredibles and if and it's incredible pun intended to realize that the Incredibles the the original film came out in 2004 it, <laughs> it seems like barely enough time has passed by but when you really think about it there were kids that were in the second grade when the first I Incredibles came out, who are now in college. <laughs> so in any event, The Incredibles 2 uh, 
reintroduces us to Bob Parr, also known as Mr. Incredible, who's voiced by Craig T. Nelson, who is left to care for Jack-Jack, their very youngest, while Helen, Elastigirl, voiced by Holly Hunter, is out saving the world. And a number of other voice actors besides Craig T. Nelson and Holly Hunter come back to reprise their roles. Sarah Vowell, who was the original voice of the daughter, of the Incredibles' daughter, is back to voice the same character. Samuel L. Jackson, whose who's, um, character, I, I know it has Freeze in the title. Uh, let me just look it up. I know it's not Mr. Freeze. That's a character in the Batman franchise. Samuel L. Jackson's character's name is Frozone. And his real alias is Lucius Best. He's back, and also Brad Bird is is back as the as the iconic seamstress Edna Mode, who creates the the costumes for the Incredibles. So I'm very interested to see how the Incredibles two is. Of course, coming from Pixar, it might suffer slightly from sequel slump. But my guess is, after 14 years, it has a very good chance of being as good, maybe if not better, than the original Incredibles. Of course, we'll have to see. Of course, these, even some Pixar sequels, like, for instance, Cars 2, are hit or miss. But I, I, I did like the prequel to Monsters Incor- uh, Incorporated, Monsters University, probably more than other people did. But in any event, Incredibles 2 is a movie I definitely will see this weekend, and I'll let you know what I think about it when I review it for you next week. Another movie that's coming out in theaters is Tag. Now, this is interesting. This is a movie about a small group of former classmates who organize an elaborate annual game of tag that requires some travel, some to travel, all over the country. The movie stars Isla Fisher, Jeremy Renner, Annabelle Wallace, John Hamm, Jake Johnson, Hannibal Buress, and several other actors. And this is apparently partly based on a true story, although I think there's some spy espionage part to it. But in any event... Uh, and, and if you check out CBS Sunday Morning on YouTube, you can find out the true story behind this film. But this is a film that looks incredible, and I will see this if um, <laughs> I will check this movie out, and I will let you know what I think about it next week. Another movie that's coming out is a movie called Superfly, which is a remake of the 1972 black exploitation film of the same name. It's directed by somebody named Director X who is, well, the name is an alias, but if you look on his IMDb page, he actually has a picture and also a biography. He is apparently from Toronto, Canada, and has directed several video shorts and TV movies before directing this remake. So Superfly, the remake, is a movie that's coming out on June 13th, that is tomorrow. I believe I will see that film, and I'll let you know what I think about it next week. However, I have not seen the original Superfly, so maybe I'll check that film out before I check out the, the remake, but of course we'll have to see. But as I recall, Superfly did actually get good reviews from notable critics when it came out in the early 70s. In fact, Roger Ebert considered it one of his guilty pleasures. But it goes against the idea of this movie being a remake to a good movie, but then again, it's, it's a remake of a black exploitation film, so it might not be all that bad. But if it's out in theaters near me, I will check it out, and I will let you know what I think about it come next week. Another movie that's coming out in limited release is actually the long-awaited movie Gotti, starring John Travolta as the crime boss John Gotti. This was a movie that was originally slated to be directed by Martin Scorsese, but is instead directed by Kevin Conley. But in any event, that movie I might check out, I might not.